Hey there, David. John McWhorter. Glenn Lowry, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Welcome back to the Glenn Show, John. Long time, no talk to. Good, about a month, I think it is, right? I think it's more than it seems like. Uh, seems like six months, John. <laughs> that shouldn't have happened. <laughs> how are you doing? What's up? What's going on? Uh, not much. Seeing out the end of the term at Columbia. I just got back from a conference on linguistics in Denmark, which was actually a lot of fun, except that I had to fly all the way to Denmark. And um, it Were you like presenting? It, Excuse me. Did you present something at the conference? I did. I um, One of my language study areas is language contact. And actually, my take on what makes a Creole language, like say Haitian Creole, interesting has been considered controversial for about the past 15 years, and I have actually mounted a frontal attack on a couple of the people who have been arguing against me because I've decided it was necessary. So I had to go to this conference, which was one of the big Creole language conferences, to make my case in person, and I think it went pretty well. John, that's exciting, and that's impressive. First of all, you have a... There's a McWhorter hypothesis out there that people take seriously enough to bother refuting. It had been doing so for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the international convocations that consider such matters at the highest level have to hear from you. Well, I don't know if they figure they have to, but I yeah. insisted on being at this one. And <laughs> so yeah. what's interesting, as I'm yeah. sure you found, is that as you get a little older, the main thing is convincing the younger ones. And so at this one, this is the first conference like that I've been to where I'm in my mid-40s, ah. a bunch of new ones who are 23, and they look at it differently than the people who are my age or older, and I enjoyed that. I see. Well, I have a vague memory of what it felt like to be in my mid-40s and enjoy being older than people <laughs> who are 20 years younger than myself, but that, is, that memory is already fading. <laughs> so my perspective yeah. on things is a good deal different from that. But I get this old, young uh, contrast because I have that in my field as well, and the young mm -hmm. whippersnappers we're coming along these days, the young economics analyst and you know and empiricist and data data manipulators and, and number crunchers don't see things the way we used to in the old days. It's like they don't have the same vision. You know <laughs> I feel like it's not a matter of convincing them, it's a matter of waking them up. I feel right. like I want to say we're social scientists, not being counters. Like, oh, they're too narrow. Yeah, oh man. Well if I begin to complain about this now, it may consume the entire of our time, and I don't know that you or the audience wants to hear it. But the short answer is yes. Hmm. Way too now. The short answer is, well, <laughs> again, sorry for the self-aggrandizement. Right. When I was in my 20s, I started reading the New York Review of Books. Mm -hmm. When I was in my 30s, I started going to read some of the books that I saw reviewed in the mm -hmm. New York Review of Books. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Very I'm nice. now in my 60s, okay? I've mm -hmm. read a good number of those books. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that I cannot find any other economist who has. <laughs> that puts it a little strongly, and it certainly is patting myself on the back. But I'll be darned if I can get anybody to talk to me seriously about anything that was written before 1990. Really? Yeah, really. And, 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 and I'm, I'll be darned if I can hold a conversation between two different parts of the department that are distinguished only by the micro subfields within which they concentrate. Mm -hmm. They don't even talk to each other. They don't go to each other's seminars. They, you know, uh, they have their own little students in their own little world. They talk to two hundred <laughs> other people. Well, little is diminutive. But I know what in, you mean. In my mind, it seems small. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk to two hundred other specialists in their area. They're only concerned about a half dozen journals. Mm -hmm. Nobody reads any books. Mm -hmm. If you publish in a book, it's already old hat because you see it took you that long to write the book, so the frontier has moved on. It's all about articles, right? And it's all about this imagined frontier and this sense of the, you know, of, of science as if the enterprise that we're engaged in were one of these particle physics laboratories where the answer is out in the 18th decimal point. Mm -hmm. And you've got a framework that you can pretty surely, we're social scientists. We're as, so, much, we're as much immersed in culture and history and the ebb and flow of politics and the, and the rise and fall of human passion as we are in the bean counting business of uh, double entry bookkeeping and adding up our sums. And yet my colleagues don't seem to know it. End of rant. I apologize. But isn't, well, I'm going to get you to continue in it a little more because I find that interesting. Isn't the idea, and I'm no economist remotely, but I'm getting a sense of an analogy with a lot of social science. The idea is that all of these numbers are the real truth and that when you go into the more 
encyclopedic or humanistic way of looking at things. All of that is just intelligent impressions that we've now gotten beyond and the truth is in the numbers. Is that the idea? Something like that. I think the I think you've got the spirit of it. I think the idea is let's talk about what we can actually know mm -hmm. what we're talking about and not let's just talk for the sake of hearing ourselves talking. Right. And I think the idea is that, for example, historical interpretation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a question about causality in the social sciences, of course. Can I demonstrate, does my theory suggest and do my data confirm that A causes B, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then there's also uh, a question about the meaning of events, how they come to be understood, what mm -hmm. significance they take on, uh, what role they play in the imaginative life and in, in the uh, symbolic life uh, of the society. Mm -hmm. uh, now, those kind of questions, I mean, let me just give a very concrete example. So, um, incarceration, this is a problem I've been working on, has risen in the United States, and there's a question of why, what cost it is. Is it because crime rates are higher? Is it because prison sentences are longer? What combination of those things has human behavior changed? Is it because of the demographic shifts and so on? Okay, so there's a question of why. There's also a question of, if you will, the meaning for American democracy of the fact of incarceration having so increased. And there's a question of the extent to which the political sensibilities that buttressed and supported the change in policies reflect this or that reaction to this or that historical event, like the riots in the 1960s or the Black Power Movement mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay? So those latter kinds of questions are questions of historical interpretation about the meaning of events. And it's possible to say of such questions, who can know the answer? Mm -hmm. Therefore, let us attend to the things that we can measure and that we can account for precisely. I think that this is a profound error. It's a moral error as well as a scientific error. The idea that I will only look under the lamppost because that's where the light shines, mm -hmm. okay? When I'm not even sure that that's the right kind of light, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. The analogy mm -hmm. is a little bit strained, but the point is people are leaning so heavily upon very specific methodological commitments and very specific substantive claims about human nature in mm -hmm. human behavior. They lean very heavily on their models, very heavily on their presumptions, and then they rule out anything that doesn't fit within their boxes. And this idea that quantitative measurement is the end all and be all, no, I'm not against it, I'm not against it. And the revolution of the late 19th century in the social sciences and the early 20th century that brought these quantitative methods and this kind of statistical analysis and these kind of comprehensive surveys of population and censuses and the data sets and all the rest, these are revolutionary and these are profound things and we've learned a lot from them. But I'm telling you, if I want to understand what's going on with prison, I'm a social scientist. I'm trying to understand the society, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I need to take this other stuff on board. And I need to be broad-minded enough first to educate myself. And then, if you will, to allow my, um, you know, analytic manipulations to be constrained and influenced by stuff, the full nature of which I don't fully understand, mm -hmm. you know? So there's that arrogance. There's an arrogance in this profession, in my humble opinion, my humble opinion that has crept in uh, to where people sneer because somebody else doesn't know as much advanced mathematics as they do. But this other person just happens to have spent 20 years immersing themselves in the culture, the history, the literature, the myth, and so forth and so on. They won't listen to anthropologists. They won't listen to historians. They won't listen to political scientists except the ones who are trying to be economists. I'm really sick and tired of them. I'm sorry. That's the end of the rant, but I had to repeat it. I'm sorry. I can imagine how that feels. It's interesting. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of some of the things that are going on in linguistics right now, although they don't impact me as directly as the equivalents in your field impact you. But it's hard when you feel like what interests you and why you came into the field is completely different from why many of your colleagues did. So in my case, for example, in linguistics, I've said, and I'm going to just boil 15 years of debate down to a very simple thing. Yeah. If you learn French, you're going to work really hard at it from the very beginning. If you learn Haitian Creole, you're going to find that it's a complex language like any other, but almost all of what worried you about French is not there. And it's because the language formed in a hurry by slaves. They formed it. And the result is that they streamlined it. They took out a lot of the harder stuff. And I just said 15 years ago, Creole languages as languages go are less complex. Okay, hold on. Let, yeah, let me just make sure I'm grasping this point. Mm -hmm. French as a language evolved over a long period of time, and so mm -hmm. its grammatical construction, I don't quite know how to put this linguistic-wise. That's good enough. Yeah. It's complex and has a lot of curlicues and a lot of barnacles and a lot curly of Curlicues and barnacles is perfect. And if, perfect. You gotta, if you're going to speak the language well, you got to learn all that stuff. Whereas, mm -hmm. 
a Creole, which is a kind of lingua franca or something. It's kind That's of developed right. within a f specific context and a hurry amongst people who couldn't otherwise communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, has stripped away a lot of that uh, layered complexity and mm -hmm. uh, in some way or another is more transparent or easier to get one's arms around. You have used many of the terms that I myself have used, including transparent. That's exactly it. Oh, and well, that's, so that's I, that I could <laughs> guess so well. Very good. This is controversial, I take it. Yes, you can see that even as a non-linguist, what you just said, which I basically sparked in you, seems to make a certain intuitive sense. Yeah. And yet, when I sense. said 15 years ago, these languages are not as complex as other ones, and here's how they're not. Oh, I, I see. It was like you were putting them down for being right. uh, backward or simple. Right. And, and needless to say, because of, you know, just who I am and what I do, I put it all very carefully, you know, there was no language to imply that I was saying anything was wrong with the languages, and I piled on all sorts of indications that I didn't think that that was the case. But nevertheless, I was, you know, jumped by people I'm not going to name because I don't want this to be ad hominem, with implications that I'm either a racist myself, and, you know, there's a certain <laughs> irony there, that I have something <laughs> against Creole speakers, or that I'm an incompetent linguist, and frankly, it's the second one that bothered me. Well, it would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've been fighting this battle for years, and, you know, there's still some people out there who could make a very good case for themselves, I suppose, who will never agree with me, but the younger ones coming in seem to at least realize that I'm not crazy, but I'll, I'll just say very briefly, the reason that I think the people who hate me the most on this hate me, and understand this is a completely separate set of people from the people who don't like my editorials about race, they don't, they're not as interested in the world's languages as I am. You know, they're interested in a little French, a little Haitian Creole, and some others, but I'm just agog at all 6,000 languages in the world, and I like to just read about them, and I've gradually found they are interested in other things, but that's not what they do. We're not in the field for the same reasons, and it helps create this inability to communicate. So I know what you mean about feeling like you're in a different place than all of the people who are your colleagues, or many of them. So then let me just ask you, John, since we're having this conversation, this wonderful conversation, I might add, about our various professional meanderings and our, our uh, rootlessness and so on, and sort of being out of step. Rootless, yeah. Being out of step. So how is your intellectual life these days there in uh, New York City? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're up in Columbia, you know, do you... Do you feel like a man without a country, or, or do you have compatriots who can kind of hear the same music? You know, it's at the point where I feel more um, compatriated lately, because I've been teaching at Columbia for four years now, and I first started doing it as kind of a lark, because, you know, editorializing alone can get kind of dull, yeah, and man. I started to miss the campus setting. I did one campus talk and I was just looking at the students out on the lawn and I had this very clear feeling. It was almost the feeling religious people describe as getting the call where I thought, all of the ambiguities aside, I missed this a little. I, I should have at least one foot in the campus setting. And so I gradually started building it, but it also ended up being more work than I thought, especially if you're a linguist at Columbia, they don't have a linguistics department. Uh -huh. So you get just jumped by you know dozens of students who need you. And that's fun, but it's work, and you're supervising these theses, and you're teaching these classes with massive enrollment. So last year, I decided I can't keep doing this for no money. They were giving me an adjunct's money, and at first I found that kind of honorable and cute, because I make enough money doing the other stuff. But I'm spending so much time in Morningside Heights now, busting my butt, that I thought I want to get paid what all the other grown-ups get paid. And I'm happy to say that a couple of weeks ago, apparently, it turned out that they're going to do it. I'm going to be an associate professor in the English department, and I'm going to have an office. Well, more John, the point, a salary. Now, so, does that mean is that a term appointment that's renewable, or are you on a tenure track? How does that work in English department? Um, every five years, okay. and I highly suspect that if I stick around, yeah. I could pull up. Although, to tell you the truth, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm real, I'm not a practical person. The tenure part doesn't matter to me that much because you know I got tenure and you can't get it again, and I don't need that particular honor. I'm just happy to get paid an, a grown-up salary. But I suppose if I stay on in order to protect myself in various ways, I should work on you know getting this tenure reappellation. Well, but for now, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. Uh, knowledgeable enough about the local scene there to advise you on, on strategy. I mean, I would say tenure is the security that you have tenure, okay? So, you know, they're not going to lay you off unless they lay everybody off. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but uh, beyond that, I mean, you know, and it's just bragging rights at somebody's cocktail party, but I, you know, you, know, <laughs> you don't care about that. No. Uh, no. So it's probably not any big deal. And I'm, I'm sure that you're greatly valued as a, as a lecturer and a teacher. And as long as that's the case, I mean, these kinds of uh, appointments of, uh, you know, sort of long-term renewable, um, if you will, teaching appointments are not uncommon. A, a, a good friend mm -hmm. of mine who was an economist and we were full professors together at Boston University for years, He's, uh, his name is Jeffrey Myron. Uh, he's actually got a pretty high profile in the world as an economic analyst, a libertarian, runs mm -hmm. conferences at the Cato Institute. You see him on MSNBC mm -hmm. commenting on stuff every now and then on the Morning Joe Show and things like that. Yeah. Jeff Myron, he's a very smart, interesting guy. Uh, he's at Harvard as a uh, I guess some kind of associate professor with a renewable five-year appointment like John McGuire at Columbia. No shame in it. I know that Harvard wouldn't let him go because they greatly value the services that he's providing, as I'm sure is the case at Columbia. Yeah, he's so, not going to get fired. You know. I, I expect you're just fine, John. I think yeah, I think fine. I don't imagine, unless I do something really stupid, I think they kind of will need me and I'm happy to be there. Well, I want to so, say Columbia's a better place for you. I've said it here before on the Glenn Show, and I'll say it again. The word I get from the inside sources amongst the undergraduates at Columbia is that you were one of the best which is the best, uh, <laughs> lecturers in the core curriculum in captivity. They're lining up to take your courses and they're talking about it long after it's over. So congratulations once again, John. <laughs> well, thank you for <laughs> spreading that around. Oh, that's so true. It's true. It. It's, it's also I obvious enjoy that you listen to you know she's going to be a great expositor. It would be fun. But, so you know, I, so I, I do feel like I'm part of a community in a way that I wasn't a few years ago. I just wanted to come back to my own little case over here in the Ivy League, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Even if I feel sometimes bored, sometimes infuriated, sometimes depressed, and, and sometimes I'm just despairing about you know the intellectual life that uh, is led within the typical economics department. Even so, I love teaching here. Mm -hmm. I love what I'm doing every day. I love interacting with these young people. Mm -hmm. uh, I like graduate teaching. Uh, with the new PhDs, even though they can't look to the left or to the right, they are so blinkered, it's unbelievable. They could tell you everything about the market, who got a job last year, what the latest little twist is, what, you know, Professor Smith at such and such a university has done in his most recent research thing, whatever. They are, you know, very, you know, attuned to what's going on today in the profession. Even so, they're not yet completely jaded. <laughs> they are they are willing to go and open up a book every now and then if you suggest that that book might be of some interest to them even though it's not right on right. you know the latest research protocol or the latest whatever whatever mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they listen uh, so I like teaching it and I just love teaching our undergraduates I mean it's just uh, sometimes I just feel uh, you know um, like I'm transported uh, isn't the question session teaching. fun the most fun for me is late in the class when they start asking questions. I like fielding the questions. Yeah. And giving the answers and kind of getting that energy going. For me, that's that's more fun than the, the lecturing part, although I enjoy that too. And watching these young people mature, watching them come through their careers and go off and do amazing things in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my students from freshman year is now um, finishing up, and he started a foundation in Durham, North Carolina to bring baseball to inner city middle school and high school kids. He's a baseball player. Mm -hmm. His name is Daniel Wilsoff, as it happens. I don't think he might be mentioning this. Mm -hmm. His foundation is called the Tobacco Road Foundation. Mm -hmm. And he's raised a little bit of money from wealthy people around in the Durham community, and he's got this thing organized, and he's got these kids playing ball. And they're talented, but more than that, you know, it's about mentoring. And, you know, more than that, it's about getting these kids out of this little narrow world that they live in and see the wider Mm -hmm. possibilities and character building and it's just amazing this kid is a social entrepreneur Glenn, can I ask okay. you a dumb question? There are 20 of them. I could name 20 of them like that, just to make the point. The point is, these kids are doing amazing things, and it's just such a privilege to be, you know. This is, that's interesting. Just a question about the baseball. Yes. I understand the way projects like this often work, and I can imagine the general outlines, but maybe I'm missing something. Don't kids play stickball? Like, why that sport? Like, how, how did they not have any baseball? I gather, and I'm not an uh, expert, uh, John, that the difference between the stick ball that you play, you throw a rubber ball up against the, the box that you've drawn with chalk on the hit, brick right. ball, and kids try to hit the curve ball, and, you know, the difference between that and real baseball is like night and day. 
Okay. And that, you know, to really play, you know, uh, baseball requires a lot of equipment. training. Equipment, true enough, and facility, you know, the right kind of diamond and field and all that. I gather right. that I'm now talking almost beyond my knowledge, but that it also requires somebody to show you how to field a ground ball, what you do when okay. it's a fly ball hit over your head, which way do you turn, how do you run the bases, what do you, what do you do with the pitchers that's doing this, that. You know, you got to face good pitching in order to become a good hitter. I guess there's a lot of stuff like okay. that. So that stick ball is not just baseball with cheap equipment in the parking lot, which is what I thought it was. I guess it's, just, it's something much less. I, I think stick ball is much less to baseball as, for example, um, uh, you know, playground basketball is to basketball. Sure. I, okay. I think it's less. I think you can get more uh, basketball on the playground, you know, relevant to being able right. to play real basketball than you can get baseball on the on the stick guard. Right. Stick like ball. you wouldn't say we're going to bring basketball to this neighborhood. They they're already. <laughs> <laughs> I see your point. Yeah, that would. Uh, but I see what you be, mean. That would be unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is just not so much about the example as about the fact that these uh, young people. Are ambitious that they're very ingenious about what they do they're extremely hard-working they're creative they're bold they're brave uh, they go off and do a lot of things and like I say I could I could give you many examples of this kid has started kid I call him kids you know this man is probably 24 years old now he was a kid a few years ago <laughs> so he was started a um, you know they've got a tea company this is a, a soft drink energy drink company that is environmentally friendly and they make the they make oh. the beverage from a bush that grows in ecuador they've gone and convinced the local authorities and they got the farmers all around and they they got their you know international logistics worked out how they can get stuff to market how they can make a, a buck on it you know mm -hmm. just just uh very clever, and like I say, I could give many other examples besides. So, yeah. You know what I enjoy about teaching undergraduates these days now that I've gotten, you know, to, to, to middle age and feel like I have some life experience to teach and talk about the book reading. You get to the point where you've been reading books for decades, and so just because you've done that, there's a weight of references that you can give people. Is that... And I shouldn't say this in public because it's going to be misinterpreted by some, but that's just okay. the way it goes. <laughs> I like that when I'm doing the more society-oriented classes, like, for example, core curriculum, or if I'm doing a, a language topic like Black English or you know, whether or not to save indigenous languages, yeah. I like giving the students both sides and in no sense making it seem like one side is somehow more important. And what I find, and what I mean by that is that I like opening the students up to views that they can sense are the ones that are considered un PC and telling them that your job is to be able to back up what you think. And if you can back it up with information and insight, then it's worth a try and we'll investigate the truth. And I think some people, I used to get this back in the day when I was regarded as particularly racially notorious. I would get, every now and then I get a letter from an angry black mother saying, I would never want my daughter to be in a class taught by you because she was imagining me standing yeah. up there talking about how lazy black people are or something. And I have never done anything remotely like that. And I'm not only talking about race, but I like to teach the students that that thing you're thinking that you feel like you're not supposed to say, it might be wrong, but please bring it up and we'll let the facts go where they may. And I think that some of the students value that I am open to having a discussion about the whole spectrum. And I think a lot of professors do that, but I feel that as a very conscious mission. The idea being that the truth isn't easy. And sometimes it is the popular view, but sometimes the popular view is not true. And that we have to examine that. I've enjoyed being able to be a sort of father figure in that sense. Well, I'm I like with you on this, John, 100%. That's it's, uh, very well put. I, you do that, don't you? I do. I try to do it. I mean... The philosophy I take is that you know you came here to learn how to think, not to think, but not to learn a particular thing. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there are in the various fields specific knowledge that a person has to imbibe. I mean, you can't do calculus unless you learn calculus, etc. Sure. But you came here to learn how to think critically, how to evaluate arguments, what is evidence, how to come to an intelligent conclusion about complicated matters. Mm -hmm. Political correctness is the enemy of that. I mean, whatever stripe it takes. Uh, people use political correctness as a bludgeon, you know, against either the left or the right, depending on what the issue might be. But the idea that, you know, you have to conform to a view because the view is popular or because you will be uh, figuratively spat upon uh, if you take, that, take up uh, the opposite view. 
Well, this is the enemy of thinking. This is this is why come to a university if that's the case. I mean, if if all you wanted was cheerleading, you could have gone to a you know a playground and, and formed a cheerleading group, and then we can all get in chant a, a mm -hmm. mantra together. So, you know, I I, I agree with that. Although, of course, you know, there are many many people teaching at universities who would say that what your job is at a university is to teach people what has been revealed to be the truth, and for them, those truths would usually be ones that would, most people on the left would be comfortable with, and the idea, to go back to this, would be that it's been proven by statistical techniques that these things are true. And, you know, I've never gone head-to-head -head with somebody who thought that way, but my students certainly tell me that they encounter many other people whose basic attitude towards all of this is that. And I suppose you should have some of them, but then there's some of us... They're so are... deeply wrong, though, in my view, if I get you right. That is, we figured it out, and so now you need to know what it is that we figured out is right. You know, what we do about mm -hmm. gay, lesbian, uh, black... Uh, you School, know, uh, education. Uh, what yeah. we do about class, and, you know, capitalism is bad, to profits are global, yeah. for, for military footprint in America, it's hegemonic, and, you know, whatever. And, and so you just need to learn the mantra. And, and here's what I think is wrong with that. Now, I never studied um, under... A person of your talents at Columbia in the core curriculum, but I did manage to read John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty somewhere along the way. We read that. Yeah. I recall very vividly this killer argument that Mill makes in there. He's, you know, he's talking about how people ought to be able to profess atheism without getting locked up. You know, which in the 19th century, you know, you could get locked up for professing atheism. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know, look, uh, let's. He's got all kind of arguments. Okay, but one of the arguments is. Let's suppose the guy's wrong, the atheist. Let's suppose he, he's just wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, however, we don't bother to refute him. We just like him up. Okay. So while we are right and he is wrong, we will in due course forget why we're right. Exactly. Our truth will have no vitality. It won't be a living truth. If it doesn't bother to refute error, mm -hmm. you, it, it can't reinforce and... Uh, make vivid in the minds of successive generations the very character of its truth. It ossifies into dogma. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's obviously right about that, it seems to me. And, and this impulse that we have to, you know, instill in the young the right thoughts mm -hmm. is, is, in my mind, deadening uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the pedagogic enterprise. And, you know, what's interesting is that you can take that famous argument of Mill's and even it can be used in ways where it can be funny to be on the other end of it. So, for example, me and my supposed linguistic heresies about what it's like when a language is new and how it's not as full of barnacles as Russian. Many people will say, I get a backhanded compliment, oh, John, that idea is stimulating. Thank you for your stimulation. And what they mean is that they're glad that somebody like me said something like that so that they can all make their case that this could not possibly be true, that any language is newer or less complicated than another one. So they value me for allowing them to make a case which they think is central to teaching the world about how language works, but it's not that they think that I'm right. And I think that I am right, and so in this case I guess I'm the atheist, but it's funny sometimes to be on the other end of that very valuable kind of comment that Mill made about those sorts of things, but, you know, life goes on. So let's talk about something else, John. Let's talk about life. If there you are, a new father. I'm very curious to know how it's going now. What are you, like three, four months into this? Three and a half. My yeah. goodness. You know what the truth of it is? I would say this, and this is, there's a culture of how you talk about babies, and I've noticed how it works, and I know how to adhere to it, but here I'm going to break a little rule, I would say, and my wife and I look forward to doing it at least one more time. The first six weeks were really tough. I mean, you, you love your child, but <laughs> the, you know, the not being able to you know, sleep through the night, and that affects the man, not as much as the woman, but still, especially if you're not a good sleeper, which I've never been, it yeah. affects you, and you know, you're trying to teach, you're trying to write things, and you're always tired, yeah. and you love your little baby, but you can't get to sleep, and they're not present yet, you know, when their eyes aren't really open, mm -hmm. and you can't really tell why they're crying, that first six weeks was really different. After six weeks, and for us it was almost to the day, the eyes open, you start getting the first smiles, the sleep gets easier, and at this point I rush home just waiting to see her. I take her to daycare. Boy, this is sounding soppy, but it's been, the first six weeks were a real challenge on all levels. After that, now I get why everybody's talking about <laughs> of having a child. And she's the funny thing about her is that she's oddly 
And I'm not to talk about patting on the back. I'm not just, she's pretty. I happen to get a pretty child. You know, people walk up to her on the street yeah, and lovely. stuff. And so that helps because she's charming. They like her in daycare. And as much as you hate to admit it, when your child is that pleasing to look at it, even I hate to admit that it even helps a little bit in your relating to them before they can talk. So, so well, how's, mother, how's mother doing? Mother is tireder than me, of course, but she has gone back to work. Uh, you mentioned and daycare. And everything is... Fine, and we're about to have extended family down to great grandparents who luckily are alive and well and mentally mentally all there. They're gonna come and spend a long weekend with us, and it's funny. It's uh, it's I can't believe that I wasn't a parent three and a half months ago. I'm surprised at how life does go on. But yeah, it's really you've been through all this. It really is. It's really something else. It's something yeah. else completely. Yeah. But you stay yourself. I always thought I would never write again. I thought I would never have another thought. I figured that I was basically going to be on pause for 10 years. And that's not true. You would you adjust. You, 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 you reconstitute yourself around your new responsibilities. So, yeah. But what, what a trip. It really is something. So I am experiencing anxiety on the other end of the life cycle with my father, who lives in Central Florida, in fact, north of Orlando, not far from where the Trayvon Martin incident played out in a gated community as it mm -hmm. happens. Uh, and he's got uh, some various health challenges and he's... And they're starting to multiply. Yeah, uh, he's 83. He'll be 83 on his next birthday. Yeah, they're starting to multiply. And he does, he sounds, you know, tired and not as alert and, you know, weak. And yeah. uh, he's, the therapy that he's undergoing for his condition is weighing on him. And, you know, it's, it's hard just, listening to that. As it happens, and he's in Florida. It's a long way from Providence, Rhode Island, or Brookline, Massachusetts, where I'm. You lives. can't go there every weekend. Yeah, can't go every weekend, and he's my dad, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, an entire. Is there any way to bring him back? Bring him up? <laughs> no. no, I mean he ain't coming. <laughs> <laughs> There's really no obstacle. I got a why would anybody want to empty house here? I mean, that's you know, if I were going to be lamenting the, my existential condition, it would uh, go to the fact of my wife having passed away six months ago, and my kids being off to college, and I'm, you know, I've got this huge house, but I don't even know what my life means anymore, and I've got all these things, you know, to take care of, and it just these routines to continue to go through, except they seem empty and bereft of any real life. You know, I don't know what my goals are, my project. I'm sorry again to be all this uh, moaning. No, I can but imagine. But here we are. I had my project. My project was very clear, you know, with my life partner and, you know, our kids and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Now i got to completely rethink the project, you know. Uh, Glenn, your project is a, is a magnum opus, I think. I'm putting myself in your head, but isn't it time to write a very rich, serious book? Nothing gets me out of that state that you're talking about to the extent that I've had an approximation of it, like having a book plan. Does that, that make sense? Big plan. Yeah, John, you really are challenging me, you know. Uh, I'm keeping notes on our conversation here. John on fatherhood, not Glenn's existential dilemma is my next note. <laughs> but, uh, you have to wake up looking forward to something. No, that's never the, the, the fact of the matter is. I have never written a big book, okay? Let's just get the cards out on the table. I'll say it so no one else has to. I've written a lot of clever little books and articles. I've never written a big book. I've never actually taken on and tried to sustain. I mean, for example, James Q. Wilson, the political scientist, died recently. Mm -hmm. I wrote a kind of intellectual old bit that was kind of critical of some of the stuff that he had had I read that. in his lifetime. But yeah. he was a great man without any doubt, and he was a part of this generation of people who were dying. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, James Q. Wilson was in his early 80s. He might have been 80. Okay, mm -hmm. and I mean he came along in the early 60s. He was professor of government at Harvard when uh, Ed Banfield was still writing uh, the very influential political scientists of mid 20th century. And James Q. Wilson has lived until 2012, and he's passed away. Uh, he's in some ways the godfather of the punishment revolution that has happened in America, etc. He's the intellectual godfather. Long and short of it is, he died. Mm -hmm. I knew him very well, okay, and I knew that generation of people uh, around uh, the American Academy in the sort of aftermath of the 1960s when we were rethinking social policy. I was present on the ground in the 15 years before Clinton's welfare reform when the early 
a smoldering of a kind of intellectual revolution about social policy was underway when Charles Murray was writing his first book and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. I knew Richard Herrnstein of the Bell Curve personally and very well. Hmm. I knew Charles Colson, who just died, very well, very well. I served for five years on the board of directors of the Prison Fellowship Memories. This is not bragging. This is no, just saying just that I've got history. a pretty interesting uh, angle of vision on American intellectual life in the last 30 years of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've been in my own little small way of participating in some of that. I'm very well trained as an economist, and I have a comprehensive grasp of the social sciences. Again, with, I say that with all modesty. But I'm just saying, I haven't even thought about writing a big book. Okay? All I've thought about doing is, you know, putting out the next fire. You know, my colleagues want to, what if I publish late? What if, uh, you know, oh, I got this clever idea. I got this graduate student. Now we got this little bell and whistle thing over here. Right. And on a separate track altogether is my public intellectual life, which consists largely of commentary, but not of any sustained critical reflection on the state of contemporary American intellectual and political life. You mean, I.e., the New York do. Review of Books? Pardon me? In other words, the only place I can think of where that would really happen now regularly would be the New York Review of Books. Right? Yeah, the New York Review of Books, it's true. And I don't know what your relationship to them is, actually. Well, they, are, really they, they invited me to write a piece some, year, some, some time ago, and I never wrote the piece, okay? I, I'm too lazy and disorganized, and I didn't write the piece that I was invited to submit something at the New York Review, and time it by and the moment pass. I'm sure if I wanted to write something for them, they'd be happy to think about it because mm -hmm. I think I have people uh, around the magazine there who admire me, including Robert mm -hmm. Silver. So, you know, I mean, again, not to be bragging, but just to say, you know, it's it's all a piece. I mean, I'm not... Anyway, um, enough of my confessing my indolence and, you know, my lack of discipline. You're right. I need a big project. That would be part of it. And maybe I need a girlfriend, too, John. You m must... I mean, I mean in, in the appropriate time. In the appropriate time. And you need to take, you didn't ask me, but piano. You need to you need to go with some young jazz musician and take weekly piano lessons because you play. Oh, John, thank you. And wouldn't it be fun to just kind of brush up and to learn some extra chords? And I'm looking right now at this beautiful grand piano that my wife made me spend an unspeakable sum to acquire and that I love, John. Let that go to see. I love the sound of that piano. I love to say I didn't let my finger tickle the ivory, so to speak. Block out the little chords that I can block out, run the little riffs that I can run. <laughs> I love it. And, you know, just yesterday, my son and I were at a jazz brunch over in Cambridge. So, and this woman was just playing these tunes, man, and she was playing them. And I was telling Glenn everything she was doing. I said, all she's doing is arpeggio on that chord there. All she's doing is arpeggio. I'm saying, look how she does a double chromatic approach to those, to those uh, chord notes in the thing. I'm saying, this is a simple blues. You can hear it. Boom, boom. I'm saying syncopation, you know, right off the beat. Boom, 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 boom. You know, mm -hmm. I'm basically giving my son a music lesson at the, at the uh, brunch table. I, I love the music, and you're right. It See, would give me it would the, give me great pleasure to have a you were talking commander. faster there. You you have to do that. I mean, you know, I do a cabaret show that kind of got me out of some blues I was having a year and a half ago. Every month I get get the get in there and play for about eleven people, and it is itself. Talk about core curriculum at Columbia. It is the ultimate good. It's just for itself. It's not for money. It's not for fame. I don't care who knows. It's just fun in itself. And it gets your chops going. You have to get better to keep on doing it. You need to let me know about that next cabaret thing. I was in New York City for a year, and I did not see you perform. It never worked while you were here. But, yeah, when you were going to see one of them one of these days. Well, I'm willing to come down because Nehemiah, my son's at Columbia, and he's, he's right. dancing in the uh, Raw Elements group there. That they put Oh, is he in that? Oh, yeah, oh, okay. man. He's a leader in that group. He's, oh, that's fun. Yeah, that's he good. and his uh, B-Boys have got a little subgroup of breakers, and uh, yeah, he's doing choreography stuff, and... Mm -hmm. I've uh, probably seen him, come to think of it, walking around. Yeah, yeah. you probably have seen him. Yeah. So, so um, what is left to talk about here, John? Have we, uh, well, you, you think we got one in the can here? You know, me? this this one is in the can. I think so. I don't think we're doing politics today. I think we're doing life today, and I think we've done it justice. This one, this one is going to be interesting in terms of how it's edited. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I think we should wait for a few weeks, and I'm going into summer. I'm going to be back on that schedule where I have, quote-unquote, summers off. I haven't done that in, in 10 years. I'm going back into the summer, 
And so I'm going to be much freer than I've been over the past. Welcome, John, to the leisure of the theory class. <laughs> That's what this is, isn't it? That's what it is, my man. Is and it's good. Yeah. In the summer. That's right. I'd like to talk to you. We'll do it again in a few weeks. You too, Glenn. Okay. See you soon. Bye-bye.